Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways, there's that word again, will save a soul from death. We have any children in here at this point, if they'd like to go to uh, Sunday school, they're welcome to. If you wanted to keep them in here, that's fine as, as well. Also, uh, the message today is going to be called Paul's Warning to the Church in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11 through 21. Uh, before we get going on that, I wanted to encourage you to pull out your bulletin, if you would, please, and take notice, if you would, by flipping it over onto the back, and you'll see all of the, the activities that we have going on during the week, and if you're not involved in a small group, we really encourage you to do so. It's a great way to grow, and uh, it's a great way to make friends, so I, I hope that you can do that as well. Also, please, at some point, uh, take out the communication sheet, and if you would fill out the information on here, particularly your name, address, and phone number, We've got people that have been attending here for quite a while, and I don't have any information on them. By the time I get out, they're gone. And so it would be great to have a telephone number where I can give you a call and say hi and get to know you a little bit. Also, if you have any prayer requests or comments that you would like to put on, we encourage you, if you would, uh, to go ahead and do that at that point. Secondly, I encourage you to pull out your teaching notes. And for those of you that are new here at Shoreline, we have a very in-depth Bible study that goes right along with the message every single week. And I send these out by email on Friday so that people can prepare their hearts and be ready for the message that comes with the questions that they might have. But as I go through, you'll be able to answer a lot of these questions. There's a few more that you'll have to dig a little deeper when you go home, and that's what it's called, digging deeper. And it depends how deep you want to go into the Word. If I just stand up here and talk to you when you leave here within 24 hours you're going to forget everything except for if I'm lucky 5% of what I say so but if you go through the study you're going to remember it because you're using your senses you're using the study and, and you're going to be able to, to take that in and to uh, to really get a hold of it I'm going to ask if you would to if you would stand in honor of the reading of God's word Second Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 11, reads, I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in, in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance, in signs and wonders and in mighty deeds. For what is it in you which, which you were inferior to, to the other churches, except that I myself was not a burden to you. Forgive me this wrong. Now for the third time, I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for their parents, but the parents for their children. And I will very gladly spend myself and, and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved by you. But but be that it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by cunning. Did I take advantage of you uh, uh, by, by any of those who I sent to you? I urged Titus, and I sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Again, do you think that we exercise ourselves to you? Do we excuse ourselves, excuse me, to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbiting, whispering, conceits, tumults, uh, lest I, I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, lewdness which they have practiced. Lord, as I look at your word today and as each of us read through that passage, uh, Lord, we're reminded just how applicable your word is, how it applies to so many different areas of our lives. And as we look back at the church in Corinth and we see the struggles and the challenges that they went through, we can't help but think of the church in America today and the struggles that we are going through today. But Lord, I thank you that your word is, is powerful, that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. Lord, I pray that it would speak to our hearts today, and if there's areas in our lives that we need to get right, Lord, through that word, I, I pray that you would speak to hearts. 
And Lord, that as we leave this place today, that we would be a little more like Jesus. And so we thank you for that time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I absolutely love the two books of Corinthians. I I hope you've enjoyed the study that we've been doing. We're down to two lessons left on on this book of 2 Corinthians, and it just never ceases to amaze me how practical these books are and how they apply to our everyday lives. And I think back to before I was a Christian, how I had Bibles in my house, but I didn't read them. And I thought that they were sanctified, which they are, but I I thought it was a, a holy thing to have the Bible in your house collecting dust. But I gotta tell you, When I started reading the Word of God, and it began speaking to my heart, I was absolutely amazed at how the Word of God applies to our everyday lives. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got a gift from God. It's called the Bible, that we can read this Bible on a daily basis and receive the guidance that we need for our everyday life. Because God said in his Word that he he said that if we are obedient, God will bless us. If we are disobedient, you tell me, God will curse us. Isn't that right? And so the word is right here, and it's here to help us. It's here to empower us. But if we take this Bible and we stick it on the shelf, we just put it in a corner somewhere, and we don't pick it up, it's not going to do us any good. We need to take the Bible, spend time in the word, but spend time with the the Lord. It's relationship, not religion. Religion is outwardly what we do. Relationship is what's going on between us and the Lord. But of all of the churches in the Bible that we cover, the ones that are the one that seems to me to be the most like the church in America today and the things that we're facing today is this church in, in Corinth. And even as Paul is struggling, we're coming to the end of, of, of the lesson, and, and I asked if he could get a sign up there that said, stop, because even though Paul has been teaching the Corinthians all of this time, they're not getting it. They're not applying it to their lives. And now he's getting to the very end of the letter, and he's coming out on them, and he's telling them they need to stop doing some of the things that they're doing. They need to get right with the Lord. They need to get right with Jesus, and that's exactly where you and I are at today. You know, so often I I, I think that we've forgotten that commitment to Christ means a commitment to holiness. And in our country right now, we're committed to Christ so long as it's convenient for us so long as it doesn't ruffle our feathers a little bit, so, so long as we get to do what we want to do. And if we hear the preacher come out, we hear somebody else come out and say something that we don't want to hear, there's always all kinds of other churches in town in which we can go to. And, you know, we've got some great Bible-believing churches and teaching churches here in town. But people can always find places where the word's not being taught. And where I've got to tell you, there's two sides to the gospel. Everything's not positive, 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 positive all the time. There's a positive and a negative, and the reason that negative's in there is to convict us and bring us to the positive, to bring us to the new life that is in Jesus Christ. We need to have both conviction and change in life, and that will encourage us to walk with Christ. Well, as Paul's writing, he's coming right up to the end of his letter, and he's frustrated. And the reason that he's so frustrated is because within that church that he had planted, false apostles had worked their way in. And they began moving those who had been given the gospel of the grace of God back to the Judaizer teachings in which it's the law plus the gospel plus. You've got to have law plus grace is equal to salvation, which is actually no gospel at all. Because what the Bible tells us is that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, apart from the works of the law. There's nothing that we can add to that. All we need to do is receive what God has already done for us in Christ Jesus on the cross. And with that, there's forgiveness of sin and there's new life. And that's the gospel. But in Paul's case, another group had come in after he left and they had brought another gospel with them. And the people were listening to them. They were listening to the false accusations. They were listening to the things that they were saying about Paul. And Paul was saying, okay, they they, they were boasting about all of these things, but they weren't listening to Paul at this point. They had caused doubts to come into their mind. And Paul says, look, if it takes boasting for you to listen to, then I'm going to boast. As much as I hate to boast, I'm going to boast. And yet Paul begins to boast, and now he's at the point where he's just, he's done. He's he's tired of boasting. They should have never reacted the way that they did. He said, I've become a fool in boasting because you have compelled me. For you ought to have been, com- for, for I ought to have been commended by you for in, for, for in nothing I was behind the most eminent apostles, even though I'm nothing. 
Paul's saying, look, when, when these guys came into your church and they began attacking my character, why didn't you stand up for me? Why didn't you protect me? Why did you go with the charges in which they're saying? I think even today in the church at large, we hear rumors about Christians, so-and-so did this or so-and-so did that, and we're inclined to believe that without going to the individual and talking to them and asking them, is this true, what was said? And Paul's saying, look, when they came to you, I should have been commended by you. You should have taken care of me. I shouldn't have to come and boast about the things that I've done in ministry. I'd rather be boasting about Christ. And he goes on, and he, he says here, he says, in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Now, some of you that have the NIV and some of the newer translations say super apostles in there. So most eminent apostles, super apostles. Two interpretations here that I need to bring up because the commentators seem to be split on this. Some of the commentators seem to think that the most eminent apostles or super, super apostles is a reference to the original 12. It's, it's a, a reference to the 12 that were in Jerusalem. And so Paul's saying the most eminent apostles, even they have nothing on me. I don't go from that school. The school I think of is that Paul's come in and they've got these false apostles. And once again, a, an apostle is one who is sent. A false apostle is sent from Satan. I think he's being very sarcastic here. I think he's coming in and he's saying, hey, look, these, these eminent, these super apostles that you've so fallen in love with that have nothing on me. And so, in, but then he goes on and he goes, even though I am nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to realize in our Christian walk that the place that we begin is from the ground floor. We don't begin on the 20th floor, the 30th floor. We don't bring anything into this package that's worth giving to the Lord. We have to be broken before God can use us. You wonder why you're going through difficult times in your life. Sometimes that's because God is breaking you. He's bringing you to the point where you realize, I can't do that. But God, you can. And when we turn ourselves over to the Lord, that's when the Lord really begins to work on us. And up until that point, it's really limited as to what can be done. And Paul realized that with all of the things that he did. He said, I'm nothing. I'm on the ground floor. But God has called me. And God is using me. Verse 12 says, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Paul's saying, look, these false apostles came in here. Did they do signs and wonders and mighty deeds? Did they do miracles in front of you? But I did. God used me in order to reach out to you. And do you know why? We do, the apostles do miracles. We do miracles, Paul is saying, because the miracles authenticate, I can't say the word, <laughs> they validate <laughs> the messenger and the message. And in fact, this, in this point, it's the, the, the works of an apostle or the miracles of an apostle here. You see, as, as we travel down, you look at these three different signs that they have. They've got signs and, 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 and um, says, uh, signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And by the way, uh, as we, we look at that word on a, a sign, we travel down a highway when we're traveling, we're going to a community that we've never been to, and what do we do? We get out there on the road, and if we just drive and there's no signs, no directions, no anything else, where are we going to end up? We don't know, right? But as we're driving, we're looking for signs, because those signs are pointing us to our final destination. And so if we follow the signs as we're going, they will take us to that final destination. But I've got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that in our spiritual life, it's the same way. That as we're going through the journey of life and as we're heading in the direction towards heaven, hopefully, and that's where Christians want to go, as we're heading towards heaven, we're following those spiritual signs that are guiding us. You see, and what Paul is saying is that the apostles, the true apostles, the ones who were sent, some of those signs were the miracles, the wonders, and the mighty deeds. Well, a sign points us. How about a wonder? A wonder is something like catches our attention. It puts us in awe. Wow, I can't believe that which I saw. Mighty deeds. I looked at the Greek word on that, and the mighty deeds is the same Greek word that we get our English word dynamite from. You know, it's something powerful that comes out. And Paul in their midst, was performing the works. And even though, by the way, as, as you go through Luke's account in the book of Acts, in, in Acts chapter 18, when it talks about Paul's time in Corinth, there's no miracles that are mentioned. 
but we know that the miracles occurred here in that city because he says so right in verse 12. You see what he says? Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you. Well, Luke's account doesn't have that, like, like I said in, in chapter 18, but he has it elsewhere. We see it with Paul when he goes and he raises up the, uh, um, uh, the, the man who had been sick and he ends up being stoned because of that. We see that when Paul, he was long-winded, kind of like me, but worse, he'd get in there and preach until midnight on the night that he was leaving. And the young man's sitting up there on the third floor, and he falls out the window, and he's dead on the ground. Paul goes down, he prays for him, and, and he's raised. Another miracle there. We find that there are other miracles that were done in Ephesus. Paul was in, in uh, Corinth for 18 months, and when he left there, he went to Ephesus for about two and a half years, somewhere in that area. But anyways, we see in Acts chapter 19, uh, when it covers that period, it says, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even the handkerchiefs or, or the aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the spirits went out of them. You see, the purpose of miracles was to authenticate both the apostles and the message in which they brought. Well, one miracle that I know for sure happened at Corinth, and one miracle that I know for sure happens here as well, and that's the miracle of regeneration. That's the miracle of being born again in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, give us, I'll, I'll just summar, summarize it, but they tell us that we were dead in our transgressions and our sins before we came to Christ. But once we come to Christ, then Christ quickened us, and he made us alive. He gave us new life in him. We're born again. Now, I've got some stones up here on the screens that you're looking at, and these stones are in the area of Gezer in, in Israel. But what they are is they're called standing stones. Israel had a practice. What they would do is whenever a miracle occurred, whenever a significant event occurred, on that very spot, they would take what you're looking at and they would put standing stones that were there for the generations to see after them that the people would come and they would see those stones and they would realize that a, a great event or a miracle has happened on this spot. Let's stop and think about it. Let's stop and see what's happened. What's so neat is that Peter took it a little bit further. He took it a step further. And what Peter said is coming to him as to, to a living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, an offering, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Do you see what Peter does on the imagery that we've got that we saw with the standing stones that were up there? All of a sudden, these standing stones that represent a miracle that's occurred in the past, a great event that's occurred in the past, is a picture of you, and it's a picture of me once that we've trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And Peter is saying that each and every believer is a standing stone. They are a living stone marking a miracle that has occurred in your life. Amen? I mean, you stop and you think about it. You were dead. And by the grace of God, now you're alive when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And now you are a standing stone so that future generations in your family, future generations out there in this world can look at you and they can see the changes that have occurred in your life. Now I've got to ask you in your own spiritual walk, are you living like a living stone? Are you living representing the miracle that God has done in your life through the, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Are you setting that kind of ex example for future generations of your children and of your grandchildren? I gotta tell you, if you really wanna find out how somebody's doing in their spiritual walk, ask those who are living in the home with them. Ask their children. Ask their grandchildren. Ask their coworkers at work. You know, are you reflecting Jesus or are you reflecting yourself? You know, and we're called to be, be living stones because we are a, a monument to a miracle that has occurred within our life. Well, in verse 13, Paul goes on, he says, for what is it in which you were inferior to the other churches, except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Apparently what had happened is the false apostles had gotten in there and they started talking to the people there and they were, they were doing everything they could to destroy the reputation and the character of the Apostle Paul. And they said, look, Paul's not treating you like the other churches. In fact, Paul is treating you inferior to the other churches. And the people began to get upset and Paul addresses that issue here. And he says, what have I done? 
The only thing that I've done is that I haven't accepted financial support from you. And we're going to see that there's a reason for that. We're going to see why Paul uh, doesn't, doesn't take that financial support. But apparently the false apostles had convinced them that Paul had treated him in an inferior way to other churches, which made them look bad and made them look immature. Well, Paul goes on, except I myself was not burdensome to you. Why wouldn't Paul take financial support from, from these, these believers? He goes in there, and he's the father of the church. He, 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 he's ministering to them. They're saying, look, Paul, okay, we want to give you money. Well, I'll tell you right now that money was an issue in Corinth. There was something going on with the hard attitude, with the money, with the donations, in which Paul felt that if he took that, it was going to injure the church rather than help the church. On another way to look at that as well is, is if they were more mature and their heart was right, I think Paul would have willingly accepted it because he accepted that support from other churches. But I think what happened here is that they weren't mature and that if he accepted it, that it was going to step them back. Well, is there ever a time for churches or for Christians to refuse donations from people? I think sometimes there are. I think sometimes if somebody comes in and they earn that money in a very dishonest way and they say, look, we want to come in and give this money to the church. Maybe at that point we may not want to take that. I don't know. You know, I'm just throwing that out there. But Paul, here we got an example of Paul right now where Paul felt that, look, I cannot take the money that they're getting because it's being given in the wrong reason. It's being given... Uh, in, with the wrong heart. Verse 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says, Now for the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but I seek you. For the children ought not, not to lay up for their parents, but the parents for the children. So for the third time, Paul's getting ready to come to the Corinthians. This is one of those other areas where there's some dispute in here, because we do have a record in Acts chapter 18 that Paul came to Corinth for his first visit that was on a second missionary journey. And we do have a record in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, that Paul had a painful visit, it appears, and yet some people doubt that. Some people say, well, Paul would have come, but it would have been a painful visit. But most believe that that painful visit was the second one, which would have been 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, and it would have come sometime during his time in Ephesus because of the things that were going on in, in Corinth. He ended up hearing about that. But here we find, as we go into chapter 13 in a few, few minutes here, but it says uh, now Paul's coming to his third visit to the city of Corinth. And he begins to explain. He says, for the children ought not to, to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So what reasoning does Paul use for not taking support? Well, we find out in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, that Paul was the spiritual father of the church in Corinth. He was the one who had actually brought the gospel to him. It reads, For though, I might have, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you by the gospel. So Paul's reminding them, look, you've got all these people coming and teaching you, these false apostles as they come in telling you all of this stuff. He said, but you've only got one father. You've only got one individual who brought that gospel message to you, that brought salvation to you. You should be listening to me. You should be listening to the words that I say. Well, like a father who wanted to care for a church without cost to them, Paul said, I'm not going to take any money. Even realizing in 1 Timothy chapter 5, or chapter 5, verse 8, that if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith, and he is worse than an unbeliever. You know, I've I got to tell you, God has given us a responsibility physically. And that physical responsibility is that when we are a, a father or a mother in a family, that we are to provide for the needs of that family. In fact, for years we worked. You know, I'm, I'm so thankful. The, the older I get, I, I look back when, when we had our children originally, and, and I think, wow, God must have given us superhuman strength at that time to be able to get through all of the things and all of the lack of sleep and everything else that we went through during that time. And you look back and you see that, and, and, and parents will work to the bone to take care of their children. And I've seen the grandparents that will work to the bone to take care of their grandchildren, to make sure that they are taken care of in the future. But if we'll do that physically, how much more should we do it spiritually? 
You know, the physical is temporary. It's only going to be here for a little bit of time. But, but the, the, the eternal is forever and ever and ever. And it's not uncommon for a parent to spend themselves out to provide for the physical needs of their family. But I've got to ask you today, are you willing to spend yourself out to provide for the spiritual needs of your family? And especially the men. I mean, that's the call for us as men to be the spiritual leaders in our family. And that's not easy. That's a tough call for each and every one of us to have. But maybe some of you here who have gone through that parenting process and now you're at the point where you've got grandchildren, are you willing to spend your life out on your grandchildren? You know, I'm, I remember seeing the bu- bumper stickers that people would have on their motorhomes and trailers and so, so, uh, so many times in the past that would sp- say, spending my child's inheritance. You know, they're driving all over, and it, which is good, which is good. That's fine to go out and enjoy the country. But even more important than that, in the final years of our life, is what kind of an impact are we making on our grandchildren? What kind of an impact are we making on our children? Because what happens here is temporary, but what happens in heaven is for all eternity. And I don't know about you, but when I get there, I want to see my children. And I, I, I don't have any grandchildren yet, but if I had grandchildren, I want to see my grandchildren there as well. Well, it's important to realize that Paul had every right to financial support, but listen to me, from adult children. But they weren't acting like adults in Corinth. In fact, no wonder they were offended at the idea that he didn't receive the money. In essence, he's saying, look, you guys aren't growing up yet. It's still my responsibility to take care of you. And so Paul ends up offending them in, in that sense. And, of course, the false apostles ended up jumping right on that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15 says, And I will gl- very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less that I'm loved. John MacArthur says, Far from seeking to take the Corinthians, Paul sought to give. The verb translated spend refers to spending money and probably describes Paul's willingness to work to support himself in Corinth. We see that in in Acts chapter 18. Be spent describes Paul's willingness to give himself even to the point of sacrificing his life. I got to tell you, if we ever want to see somebody who was willing to spend and be spent for the gospel of Jesus Christ, it was the apostle Paul of all of the things in which he went through. And it's Paul who says in other parts of the scriptures, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Who was another one? In fact, who was the one to spend and be spent for us, for for his children, for us, for his brothers and sisters? Well, verse 16 moves on and says, but be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by cunning. You read verse 16, you think, Paul, what are you saying? You know, he says, but be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by cunning or by being crafty. Well, what's going on? We get a feel here for some of the the, uh, accusations that the false apostles were making here as they began to say that one of the things was that that Paul was was crafty. But Paul had already addressed this whole issue in in this letter earlier on in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Paul said, therefore, since we have this ministry, we have received mercy. We do not lose heart, but we have renounced. Do you catch this here in regards to the accusations that they're making about craftiness and deceitfulness? Deceitfulness says, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And Paul's saying to them, look, I have not been crafty. I haven't been cunning. I haven't been deceitful in the way that I've shared the word of of God to you. I have been forthright and I have been true. But then in verses three and four, we get a little bit more on here. He says, but even even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, And who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You know, Paul's saying, look, these these guys are coming, and and even if we come, we share the gospel, that you're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, apart from nothing. 
And we do that, don't we, with our family members. We share with our family members. We share with our coworkers, and we wonder, why aren't they responding? This message, which is so precious to us, this message, which is the difference between death and life, means nothing to them. It doesn't make any sense. We want to see our family in heaven. We want to see our friends in heaven. Why aren't they getting it? Paul gives the answer right here. He says that even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, and the next part is critical, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You want to know why your family members don't believe when you share that gospel, which is so precious to, to them? At this moment, their minds are blinded. Don't get angry at them because they don't believe. The enemy has attacked them. The enemy has blinded them. You need to understand that. When I began to understand that, it just gave me all kinds of more compassion for people who don't know Christ because of the struggle that they're going through. is not a matter of arrogance. It's a matter that they cannot see. It does not make any sense to them. And we need to treat them with love and reach out to them. You know, who were the ones who were really deceitful? Who were the ones who were really crafty? Do you remember back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, that the serpent was more crafty than all of the animals that God had created? And he said to Eve, he said, Eve, did God really say? Satan always questions God. He always questions the truth of God's word. Did God really say? In fact, we find uh, a little bit back in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, Paul explains who these false apostles are. He says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their work. So the very thing that the Apostle Paul is being accused of, of being crafty and cunning, is exactly what the enemy and his minions are doing, the enemy and his false apostles. Remember, an apostle is one who is sent. An apostle of the Lord is sent from the Lord. A false apostle is sent from Satan, and they're going to operate like Satan would operate. You see, how do you know today when you hear all that going on in Corinth, how do you know today the difference between a true teacher and a false teacher? Because we run into it all the time. There's lots and lots of teachers out there. How do you know the difference between the true teacher and the false teacher? And I've got to tell you, the, the key here is to be a Berean. The key is to go to God's word, that when you hear something from a teacher, you go and you examine the things that he said to make sure that those words are true. Just because I'm up here every week teaching, just because I'm called your pastor for many of you that are, that are here, I'm asking you personally that when I say something, check it against the word of God and put that practice into your life that wherever you go, you do that. And if you think I made a mistake in a particular area, it's possible that I may have, come and talk to me and we work from there. And so it's critical that we be, be become Bereans and that we understand the word of God because I gotta tell you, the power is not in the, in the charisma of the speaker. I've seen lots of charismatic speakers that are out there that can really go to town. The power is in the word of God. And if souls are going to be changed, it's right here. You may not be the best preacher. I may not be the best preacher. But the power is in the word of God to change lives and to give new life. The power is in the word of God to take your life and to help you grow into the kind of man or woman of God that God would desire for you to be. It's critical that we spend time in God's word every day so that we can get to know him more deeply and more intimately. John MacArthur continues on his thoughts. He says, according to his opponents, Paul was both deceitful, uh, a deceitful hypocrite because he really did take the money from the Corinthians after all, despite his words in verses 14 and 15, and that he was also a thief. This is what the false teachers are saying. They, the, the charge was all the more painful to Paul because it challenged the character of his friends. It out, outraged that the Corinthians could believe such ridiculous lies. Paul pointed out that his associates did not take advantage of the Corinthians during their earlier visits regarding the collection. 
The simple truth was that neither Paul nor his representatives had in any way defrauded the Corinthians. These guys won't stop at anything. Paul's out here, and what he's wanting to do, what's on his heart, is the needy brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Incredibly difficult over there. They had come to Christ in the center of Judaism, and because of that, they were being disowned by their family members. They were losing their jobs. They were probably losing their, their, their houses. They were, they were losing everything, and they were destitute. And Paul's traveling around, and he's taking these collections so that they can take the money and give it to them as an offering from the Gentiles. And by the way, who had a hard time with the Gentiles coming into the kingdom of God? The Jews and the Jewish believers. Take this money and give it as a love offering to help them out. False apostles come in and say, yeah, this Paul, I got to tell you. He's coming in. He's, he's, he's so self-righteous. He's saying, look, I'm not receiving any money from you. No, that's not going to happen. No. And then he sends Titus, and he sends his friend over to you to take a collection, to send it to Jerusalem. Do you know what this guy's doing? Do you really know? He's making you think he's so righteous and holy. But in fact, what's happening is after Titus and, and, and this other uh, believer that's with him take the offering, they're taking it to Paul. Do you know what Paul's doing? Paul's skimming the top. That's where he's getting his money. Do you see the deceitfulness of the false apostles that had worked their way in? Do you see what they're doing? If you can take away the integrity of the leader, you take away the integrity of the ministry. And people were believing it. How do you think Paul felt? Do you think he got upset at that? Do you think he thought, how can these people do that? And I got to ask you, what would cause Paul to stoop to boasting because you had false apostles like this that were attacking not only his character, they were attacking the character of anyone who associated with him. They were after Titus. They were after the other brother. They were really going at him. Have you ever had anyone tell a, a painful lie about you? I mean, I got to tell you, it's really hard when somebody does lie about you. And how do you defend yourself? How do you react? How should we respond as Christians? And we find out in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 14, I'll just read through it quick, quickly. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be, not, be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Here's the key right here. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends upon you, live at peace with all men. I've had people come to me, and, and I've asked them, you know, as far as is possible with you, are you right with the Lord? You know, and, and they'll kind of waffle a little bit, or I'll ask them, are you right with the Lord right now as far as you know? And they'll say, well, I'm in a relationship, you know, and I, I just can't seem to get this relationship right. And, and I'll ask them, I'll say, but as far as it is possible with you, have you tried? Are you willing? You know, and, and they'll say, yes, I've tried again and again. Well, then you're okay for communion. You can partake in communion if you're, if you're right or you're trying to be right. But you see what it says here? When people are angry at you and they're coming on you, it says, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For so doing, you will heap coals of fire on the head. And then verse 21, do not overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How do we respond when people lie against us? We pray for those. Jesus said that we're to pray for those who persecute us. How do we respond when our feelings are hurt because of that? Do we flare out on them? No. As far as it's possible for us, we live at peace with other people. And we allow God to take care of it. Because God can take care of it in a much better way than you and I could take care of. And every time we take the leadership and we go to do it, things have a way of getting really bad, don't they? Verse 18, I urged Titus and I sent our brothers with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? You know, you see what Paul did? He said, okay, I'm going to take this collection for the, the, the poor in Jerusalem, but I'm not just going to send Titus. Who else is he going to send? A chosen brother who was chosen, who was picked by the congregation as a man of respect. 
And whenever Titus had money, he had a witness from the churches in Macedonia with him to take it with them. Do you see how wise Paul was in that? If he didn't have that backup, if he didn't have that accountability, any number of things could have been said, and how would he have stood? You see, even today in churches, there's times when we need to do things in twos for accountability. There's times when we count the money. In fact, every time we count the money in here, we do it with two people counting the money, at least two that are back there. And there's other areas of accountability when we're in dangerous situations in which a false accusation could easily be given against us. Take somebody with you, you know, and, and be careful to protect yourself because the enemy is always looking a way to bring, for you, a way to bring you down because if he can destroy your character, he can ruin your testimony. Well, Paul writes, did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? In other words, didn't Tim, or Titus and I have the same goals as we went out to minister? It's interesting that, that Titus may have been a lot like Paul in that when he went to Corinth, they may have had the same goals and ministry, and Titus may have went to work as well. We see in Acts chapter 18, uh, verses 3 and 4, uh, it, it says, well, let me back up. I'll read verses 1 through 3. It says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens, and he went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy to his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them, and then we see in verses 3 and 4, it says, so because he was the same trade, he stayed with them, and he worked by occupation. They were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Do you see what Paul was doing here? Paul came as the church planner. He came into an area in which there was no church. How did he do that? Did he just sit at home and watch everything? He got out in the workforce, and he got to meet the people. He mingled with the people. He spoke with the people. On the Sabbath, he would go into the synagogue, and he would reason with them from the scriptures as he announced that. Now, for Paul, he would build the churches up, and then churches would help him, and they would help the other believers and so forth. But they had that money problem in Corinth. And there's a good chance that perhaps Titus himself, when he arrived there, that he too went to work. William MacDonald said, it appears from this passage that Titus worked for his living by engaging in some secular op occupation. That is suggested by the questions, did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? In other words, both Titus and Paul followed the same policy of working so that they would not have to be supported by the Corinthians. Verse 19, and again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. Paul's saying, look, these false apostles are saying all of these things about me. Do I have to answer to them? Do I have to ultimately answer to you, Corinthians? What's Paul saying? Who do I answer to? I answer to God. And we need to realize that in our own ministries as well because whenever you go into ministry, whenever you stick your head above the crowd, somebody's going to take a shot at it. I guarantee you. If you've ever been in ministry where you're serving, you're going to find that people to come walking in the doors, the only people who are allowed are, are, are sinners, saved by grace as we come in, and, and, and sinners <laughs> who haven't come to that point yet. But even within the churches, you're going to find that there's church politics, that there's church issues, and unfortunately, it shouldn't be that way because as we gather together, the one that we need to answer to is God, and we need to check our hearts to make sure that we're right. Let me just say, too, if an accusation is made, nobody's above that accusation. If an accusation is made against me or anyone else, it's up to us to examine our hearts to see if we're right with God. And I think each and every one of us need to do that. If somebody says to us something, you did this, then we need to examine our heart to see if there's any truth to it. If there is truth to it, then we need to repent and we need to get right with God. If there isn't truth to it, then we need to realize that the one that we have to ultimately answer to is God and move forward from there. Well, you know, who would, who would Paul answer to? Paul would answer to the Lord. In fact, we find that each and every one of us will have to answer to the Lord. He, Paul had wrote earlier in the book, he, in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 through 11, he said, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God. And I also trust that we are well known to your conscience. 
we are so blessed to be Christians because we know that when we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we're able to go immediately in the presence of the Lord when we are born again Christians. But what a lot of Christians fail to realize is that when we do go to heaven, we're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, can you imagine what it would be like on that day if we were before the judgment seat of Christ and they had DVDs in heaven and all of a sudden in front of the Lord, in front of his angels, in front of the multitudes that are there, that DVD was played of your entire life. Can you imagine that? Aren't you thankful that 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that when we go to Christ, we can ask for that forgiveness and we're forgiven indeed, that we do have that. But it's always struck me that people read verse 10 and they don't read verse 11. Sounds pretty heavy, doesn't it? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known to your consciences. There's a second judgment that we find in the scriptures, and that's in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And that one's called the great white throne judgment. I'm just going to read through here. It says, then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from, those, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were open, and another book which was open, which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Wow. Stop and think about that. There's tabs on the things in which we've done. Now, in Christ, there's forgiveness. But at the great white throne judgment, there's accountability for that. The sea gave up its dead. Who were, who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead and uh, who, were, who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone, who, who's anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. As Christians, we go, Whew, I don't want to go to that great white throne judgment. I'm so glad that we don't have to go to that. We go to the judgment seat of Christ, right? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? That each one may receive things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I don't think Christians today realize that the day is coming when we will stand before Christ and we will answer for the way in which we live our lives. And if we really believed that, if we really believed in the great white throne judgment, then knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we would be very busy out there persuading and doing what we can to reach other people for Jesus Christ because it is so critical for them to come to Christ and be saved. Paul says, but we do all things ministering to the, uh, in other words, he's saying ministering to the Corinthians, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. How about those false apostles? Why were they there? What did they go, what were they sent to do? Well, if it was Satan who sent them, they were sent to destroy the church in Corinth, weren't they? And they were doing a very good job if they could get away from that gospel of the grace of God, that when we turn to Christ, we're forgiven. Yeah, we may have to stand before, but that's a reward of, of uh, our judgment of rewards as we look at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, but we, we're forgiven in Christ. And the false apostles came in with the mission of destroying the church in Corinth. But Paul came in as a true apostle with the mission of building up the church. Why, in fact, in 1 Corinthians, were Christians given so many spiritual gifts? For what purpose? For the building up of the body of Christ. That together we build up the body of Christ. We are called to building up. We're not called to tearing down. And each and every one of us needs to examine our hearts each and every day, the way we treat our families, the way we treat our coworkers, the way we treat others in work each or, or at church, each and every one of us should be checking that out. Well, verse 20, it goes on and, and says here, it says, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults. So much 
is going on here in that church. And, and Paul's greatest fear as he's coming back to Corinth once again is he's going to get back there and he's afraid that they didn't learn a thing in everything that he said. They didn't hear it. They didn't learn a thing. He's going to get there and he's going to find all of these problems of immaturity are going on within the church. He's going to end up finding out that the church that he comes into is a very worldly church, that they've taken the customs of the world. And by the way, Corinth was as wicked of a city as you would find in the ancient world. But that they've taken the customs of the world and they've blended them into the body of Christ. Aren't you glad we don't do that today? <laughs> I think we do. I think today we do bring in the world around us and we blend it into the body of Christ and we forget that it's a holy God that we're serving. And in fact, today I think people forget Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, in which the writer of Hebrews says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. But look at the last part of that verse. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Do you realize that each and every Christian is called to a holy life? And that means a set-apart life for Christ. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. We're going to have sins that occur in our lives. But hopefully when we come to Christ, we're here. And over the years, we're getting closer and closer and closer to being like Jesus as we develop in our spiritual walk. And we forget that each and every one of us is accountable to God to be holy. Verse 21, lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, the fornication, and the lewdness which they have practiced. By the way, that word fornication, we don't use it very often today, do we? What would that mean to sexual sin? And I got to tell you, if you think sexual sin is not prevalent in the church, you ought to become a pastor. You ought to become someone who gets in and talks to people. Sexual sin is in the church even as much as it is in the world. And we're called to be separate from the world. We're called to be like Christ. Well, Paul was afraid that when he got there, he'd find many of the problems in the church that he'd written about earlier that hadn't been, been dealt with. Warren Wiersbe says they, there were terrible sins in the church, and Paul wanted them judged and put away before he came. Otherwise, his visit would just be another painful experience. Paul made it clear that his desire was to solve problems and strengthen the church. Sins in the church must be faced honestly and dealt with courageously. To sweep them under the rug is to make matters worse. Sin in the church is like cancer in the human body, and it must be cut out. He saw that it wasn't just the church in Corinth that was having those kind of problems. Paul wrote to the church of Rome in Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. Paul wrote, he said, and, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Lesson learned for us, faith lesson here. What's that? That if we don't listen to God and we choose to do whatever it is that we want to do anyways, God's going to say, okay, you go ahead and do that and reap the consequences. And we need to hear that. God gave them over to a debased mind. Even though they, they, they knew that they should honor God, they did not honor God. He says uh, God, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undeserving, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. In verse 32, Paul says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but they also approve when they practice that. Wow. The, the church knows the things are wrong, but what do they do? They approve and they practice them anyways. Have you been watching the news this week at all? The, they came out this week with Pope Francis with a comment and uh, the comment surprised a lot of people. And I don't fully know what to take on this thing at this point because I can see part of what's being said and part of what's being s said by the other side over here. But basically, in a nutshell, what he did is he came out and he talked to the Catholic Church and through an interview, and he told them that when it comes to abortion and homosexuality, they need to back off. They need to stand down, not stop completely, but they need to soften up. 
And it's, you know, only time is going to tell what happens in there because the Catholic Church has been one of the few institutions that's remained strong in those two areas of abortion and homosexuality. And where they're going, I'm not quite sure. But I definitely know where our culture is going, and I think you do too. I think each and every one of us have been able to see that. But what we need to realize as Christians is, is that we are not called to be politically correct. We are called to be biblically correct, but listen to me here, in love. We're not called to be politically correct. We're called to be biblically correct in love. We don't want to come down very judgmental. That may have been what Francis was saying, what Pope Francis was saying. I'm not quite sure. Time will tell what ends up coming out. But people need Christ. But at the same time, we cannot condone open sin within the body of Christ. There's a time for the church to stand up and say that something is wrong. It's, it's interesting that uh, Paul had warned the Corinthians in his first letter already. In fact, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter, nine, verse, verses nine, or chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, Paul wrote, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, who are the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I had a friend of mine come to me one day, and he's talking to me, and he look, says, look, my, my brother has committed adultery. I read the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Does that mean he's not going to be able to go to heaven? No matter what ends up happening, he's not going to be able to go to heaven. And as I, I listened to my friend, uh, something just didn't seem to fit. And later on, he came out and let me know that he had done that in his youth. And he was just scared to death from the thing in which he did. But let me read that passage to you again. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the, uh, the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators goes on and on and on, right on down. Adulterers, everything else. Here's the key, ladies and gentlemen, to this. Each and every one of us sin. We're sinners by birth. We've got a sin nature that we battle with all the time. But as Christians, we are sinners who are saved by grace. The people that Paul was talking about in that particular passage were people who were in that lifestyle, period, actively involved doing it. There's a difference between having it done in your past and repenting of that sin and being forgiven. And in your face to God, I'm going to do it, period. And what Paul is saying in that sense, what God is saying in that sense, is those people have no part in the kingdom of God because they've got no desire to follow the Lord. They're right in his face. In fact, to clarify that, in verse 11 of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were out there. You did those things, but you repented. And when you repented, it says, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were cleansed in Jesus. And i got to tell you, when we come to Christ, our lives need to change, ladies and gentlemen. We need to become more like Jesus. When we look to the Word of God, Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what? You will obey my commands. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. How much do you love Jesus today? Are you willing to obey his commands in some of those areas that our culture says is okay and your heart saying, I want to do it, but at the same time, you know that it's wrong? Well, sin has a way of slipping into our lives when we let our guard down and I've, been, I've got a devotional by Billy Graham uh, that I've been reading uh, every day. It's fantastic. It's called Hope for Each Day. If you don't have it, you might want to get it. I don't usually use a quote from the same source twice in a row here, but I'm going to use this one because this was fantastic this week, and it really deals with our topic. Billy wrote, A boat doesn't sink because, it, because it's in the water. It sinks because the water gets into it. In the same way, Christians don't fail to live as they should because they are in the world. They fail because the world gets into them. They don't fail to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit because we live in a sea of corruption. 
We fail because the sea of corruption has gotten into us. Most ocean-going vessels have pumps running constantly, sucking out the water that might have leaked into the hull. In a similar way, we need to keep the pumps of repentance running. We need to plug the holes with the truth of God's word. Don't let the world sink your ship. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, nobody goes out and says, look, I, I'm, I'm just going to turn away from Christ and, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do, period, who's a born-again Christian. But we can, let our, we can let our defenses down and the world begins to slip in. And I've got to tell you, I've used the illustration so many times, but I can't think of a better illustration. I used to go up onto the river kayaking or at least I was fishing as the kayakers went up the river, uh, Stanislaus River, uh, up out of Angels Camp, California. We had a cabin there when I was growing up. It was one of the best whitewater rivers in, in California until they dammed it up. And that river, that Stanislaus, would roar. And as the kayaks were coming down, they'd come down the river, and I'd be fishing out there, and then the rapids would be right in front of me, and the incredible pressure coming. And those kayaks would go right on up right on up the water, and I'm sitting there wondering, how are they doing that? And as long as they kept moving, the kayaks would go up, and they would get up over the rapids that they were going through. But the moment they stopped paddling, something happened. What happened? Immediately, that kayak went, flipped around, swoom, shot down the river again, started going down the river again. I can't think of a better picture of our Christian life. So long as we're moving forward, so long as we're seeking the Lord's will, so long as we're spending time in God's will, in God's word, each and every day in prayer, getting to know him better in fellowship with other believers who are encouraging us, we're making progress, we're going forward. But as soon as we become discouraged, as soon as we get uh, distracted by something else and we stop, immediately our spiritual walk turns around and goes right back down the river. Maybe some of you are here today going through that. But my question to you as I conclude this message today is how are you doing spiritually? As people look at you, are you reflecting that living stone, that miracle from God, that monument to a work that God has done in your life to the generations after you? Or are you the kayak rider who's given up paddling and you're just shooting down the river and one of these days you're going to crash into the side somewhere. I just want, as we go in prayer, I just want you to, to examine your own heart and see where you're at. And I'm going to ask that the worship team come up as we pray. Father, I thank you for each and every person who's here today. And Lord, all of us deal with sin in our lives. And yet you've given us the cure in Jesus. You've given us the cure in your Holy Spirit. You've given us secure in your word when you said that if we confess our sins, that you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, I pray that whatever's going on in the sanctuary today, for, for people, what they're wrestling with right now, that they would take that and confess that and lay it at the foot of the cross, realizing that there's forgiveness in Christ Jesus. Lord, if there's someone here today who's never received Christ as their Savior, I pray they might just pray a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I've messed up big time, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to come into my heart and life, and Lord, help me to be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. Lord, I repent of my sin, and I give my life to you this day. And then, Father, if there's someone here who's drifting down the river right now, I pray by your grace you would give them the strength to turn that kayak around. And Lord, that they, through prayer and, and worship, time in your word, fellowship with other believers, uh, getting to know you more deeply and more intimately, would reestablish that relationship with you. And we just lift that person or, or those people up to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen.